Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? This is how this book is opened. And in fact, in chapter 12, when the book is ending, it says again, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commands. This is the whole duty of man. How much of your life, of your day-to-day goings-on, is spent chasing after the wind? How much energy, how much anxiety is spent chasing after things that are vanity, in the words of the preacher. Think about the things that you were anxious about that controlled your mind a month ago, a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, and where those things are currently in your life and what sort of hold they still have on you and your anxieties. What is the point of all that you do? Why do you do it? What's the reason? What's the end goal of all of your hustling? Do you um do you like to you like to people watch? That's what they call it, people watch, where you just where you just watch people, right? And you you can do that at at the mall. Maybe you sit down at the store and you I um one of my favorite things to do when I'm shopping with my wife, actually my favorite thing to do when I'm shopping with my wife is to sit down, right? Any store that has a chair in it is immediately my favorite store because when I'm sitting, I'm much more patient. But I find a place and I will sit while my wife Shops, which well, she never does, not a shopper, right? But I'll sit and wait for her as she is going, and I'll just, you know, just watch people. You do that too, don't you? You do. You would admit it, but you do. You watch people, and you you listen to conversations while you're pretending that you're not, and all of those things, and watch them go by. Or very often, as I'm as I'm driving or sitting at a red light, and I'm watching just cars whirl by in every direction, and and you think about this this very odd and massive real story that all these people have their own lives their own worlds, their own families, their own history, their own future, their own dreams, and their own goals, and their own anxieties, their own stresses, all them things that are going on in their world and their lives that I have just no idea about. And here they are just whirling about me at all times, crossing the intersection, walking around the mall, walking through the stores. And that's that's, that's an odd thing to think about. There's this whole infinite number of worlds that are disconnected from me entirely. But the, the, the truth is that we think about in those moments is that all of these people are out there hustling for something. Out there chasing after something. And the point here, as we begin Ecclesiastes, the basic point is, is that the massive majority of that chasing, of that hustling, of that moving on, is nothing more than chasing after the wind. Is vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. How many things that are on your mind this morning that have been occupying your thoughts They're causing your anxieties about the week to come, about the afternoon to come, the day to come, about what happened yesterday, the day before. What how what percentage of those things that have been on your mind today are really in the end meaningless vanities chasing after the winds? How many things in your mind today are nearly as big of a deal as you've made them out to be? How many things on your mind today are going to be on your mind in the same weight in a few days, much less a week or a month? How much of your anxieties are going to still be there in a year or five years? How many of those things are you concerned about today will you look back on in years to come and think, I can't believe I was so anxious about that. God had it together all the time. Too much priority are you giving to what things? Too much anxiety are you giving to what things? We are living a life very often like a connected dots drawing and we just move from this dot to that one and from that dot to the next one and all we can see is the dot right in front of us and we never stop for a moment to ask what exactly picture are we drawing? What does this look like that we are doing? Why in the world am I connecting these dots? What is the purpose of me going on every day from Monday to Tuesday, from Tuesday to Wednesday and Wednesday to Thursday? This book that we're going to be looking at and studying as our next series, this Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. It's one of my favorites for a lot of reasons, largely because it is continually relevant to every passing culture. I hope, as we're studying this together, that you will be reading this book along with me. We'll be moving through it basically chronologically um, in short sections, and uh, so you'll know where we're going to be about the next week. 
just some introductory statements. Most think that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, and he may have. We don't really know. What we do know is that these are the words of the preacher. That's, that's how the book starts and how it ends. The words of the preacher. Now that word preacher is the Hebrew word kohelet. And that, it, really just means, it really just means assembler. And it, to, just to make that point a little clearer, that word in Greek, kohelet, is the word ecclesiastes, which comes from the word ecclesia, which maybe you know is the word throughout the New Testament translated church. That's the word for church. And it just means gathering. It means assembly of people, people coming together. And so this is the idea of the person who is speaking. And he's not even the author, right? Co the kohelet there, the preacher, is not the author of Ecclesiastes. He's just sort of the main character that the author is introducing us to, right? He starts in the beginning of the letter and said, okay, here's some words of the preacher. And then he tells you all the words of this teacher, this philosopher, whatever your version says, this kohelet, this assembler. And then he ends the book by saying, the preacher also taught these things, and this is what he said. So the book of Ecclesiastes really is the words of a preacher, kohelet, recorded by an author who thought his words were worth writing down. Of course, inspired by God along with it. All I want to do today as we begin this series, we're not even going to really begin getting into the text itself. We'll start that next week with the first verses. All I really want to do this week is um, lay out to you the, the big themes of Ecclesiastes that we'll be seeing as a drumbeat from every chapter that he is really focusing on. The big ideas that Kohelet wants to get across to his listeners. The preacher wants to get across to, us, uh, to his listeners and God wants to get across to us. First one is this. And really they're all kind of underneath this heading. Here's the truth. We humans want control. We want control over things. Much of our existence is an effort to gain control over things that really, unfortunately, we can't have any control of. Right? One of the main messages, if I have a thesis of Ecclesiastes, it is this. We want control, but we cannot have it. We want control of our lives. One theologian said the, the main obstacle to living well in this world is that human beings consistently refuse to accept our mortality and our finitude. Now, we're not really having a big effect on things. <laughs> that basically, we're not controlling anything at all, and we're just kind of riding along this thing that we call life. That we are temporary, that we will die, and that we'll have very little impact on anything or control over anything at all. Kohelet sets out to convince you of this. That sounds kind of negative and kind of Debbie Downer-ish, but there's, there's good reasons for us to come to these realizations that we are indeed lacking control when it comes to our lives and comes to the world. The Bible sees, in large part, the entirety of human existence... From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, we as humans, um, largely in our failed attempt to be like God. From the very beginning, we start this desire for us as humans to be like God, and that's really the struggle of all mankind throughout history. We want to be like God. Now, what that means is not primarily that we want to be like big and shiny, right, and, and sitting on a throne and all of those things. and It doesn't mean those things. What it means largely is that, is that we want to be in control. We want to be like God and that we want to have control of things. We want to have control over our lives, control over the things that we are facing. We are not satisfied with the freedom that God has given us. We want ultimate freedom. We want absolute freedom. We want to be able to do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. We want to be able to control the things that are going to happen to us and that are happening to us currently. Control over our lives, control over our futures, control over our loved ones' safeties, control over our finances and our security and our relationships. We want control. And this problem derives chiefly from our refusal to accept our divinely ordained boundaries. And that God says, here's the boundaries, and we, from the very beginning, have said no. And again, we get it honest, don't we? Remember that story, Adam and Eve, first chapters of the Bible, where the serpent comes to Eve and says, you will eat this fruit and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve Eve sees that opportunity, not just as a piece of fruit that looks appetizing, but an opportunity for some more control, to know more, to have more knowledge, and then have more control over the world that she is living in. God has set these boundaries up, but she wants to push past them. Think about, think about all that God had done for Adam and Eve. Think about all the freedom he had given them. 
Right? God doesn't say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend seven minutes in the morning digging a hole, and then I want you to spend 11 minutes eating breakfast. God says, here's a massive garden, beautiful garden, all these wonderful animals, all these wonderful things. Enjoy them. There's just one thing, right? There's one thing that you cannot do. Very limited boundaries. Everything else is great freedom that Adam and Eve have. You want to eat from that tree? Go eat from that tree. You want to go do this with the lion? Go hang out with the lion. You want to, you want to just enjoy the garden I've given you. Just don't eat of that one tree. And Adam and Eve said, ah, you know, that freedom's nice, but it's just not quite enough. Right? That kind of control you're giving me over these parts of the garden is good, but it's just not all that I want. I want control over all the garden. I want ultimate freedom. I want to be able to do whatever I would like to do, including that one tree that you said I couldn't eat from. We get it honest. And Quite frankly, this is still the thing in all of our hearts, in all of our bottoms, and all those, especially who are not Christ, we still want control, we want freedom, ultimate freedom, no boundaries for us. Regardless of what it means for us to go past those boundaries. Imagine if you, imagine if you lived out in the boondocks, as they say, and you're 50 miles from civilization, from neighbors or anything, but you have a lot of land and you, and, you, and you build a big fence around all of your land. And your land's so big that when you walk in the back porch, you can't even see the fence, right? You just know it's there. And, and you've heard, you've been told that, that in your area, there, there are predators, there are wolves in, in your area. But you build a fence and make sure that your land is clear of all of these dangers, all of these predators. Um, and, and you have children and you say, okay, children, here's what, what, what I have for you. I've built this backyard for you and it is wonderful. I have playgrounds and there's a lake and there's a pool and there's all kinds of beautiful, wonderful things and there's tree houses and there's all these great things for you to enjoy. All I'm asking of you is to stay inside the fence. Because you know outside the fence, all that is left for them is desolation and harm. And so the children are okay playing in there for a bit, but it doesn't take long when they start wondering, hmm, this freedom's nice, you know, but I wonder what's past that fence. And, and the assumption there is, the assumption that we still make as humans, that something outside of the fence must be better than what exists inside the fence. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve. It must be that God is holding out on me, and that out there is something that's even greater than what he has given me in his good gifts of the things inside of this backyard. The freedom he has given us is just simply not enough. We want ultimate freedom. Why does God get the control? We wouldn't say it like that. But the world thinks it. Why does some say it like that? Why does God get control? Why does he get to call the shots? Why does he get to decide the way I live my life and the things that I do? I deserve to go wherever I want to go. I get to control these decisions, not him. The children say that to the parents who have built a fence for them. And the parents know that as soon as they leave, it will just be their harm. The same thing that God knows for us, that everything good that he intends for us is inside those boundaries. There is nothing good outside of them. Control is not something God has granted us. We have always, from the beginning, hated those boundaries, hated those fences that God has put up for our good because of his love for us. And control is not something God has given us. He has granted you so much. He has given you so much, more than you could ever exhaust, more than you could ever fully enjoy. He has granted you so, so much, but he has not granted you full control. If you think you have control of your life, you just haven't lived long enough yet, right? If you think you have control about how things are going to go for you, you just haven't experienced enough in life yet. You can ask those in here who have lived longer than others. So is the fence builder limiting the freedom of those inside? Yes. But for the good, for the joy, and for the glory of those that are involved, God alone has control. And that's the world you want. God alone has control because God alone is the one capable of doing the right thing with that control. You don't want a world where you really have ultimate control and you can't have both, right? Because, because if, if you have total freedom, if you have control, then God does not have control. But if God has control, then you don't. It is against this background that Kohelet speaks, seeking to persuade us his readers and his listeners, of the futility of the ongoing human quest for control. Stop, he says. It's not going to happen. You're not going to gain control. Life is out of control. Secondly and further, all is hevel. There's another Hebrew word for us today. All is 
Hevel. This is actually what it says in those passages. Hevel of Hevel, says the preacher. Hevel of Hevel, all is Hevel. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? All is Hevel. And he says it again at the end. Get there in a second. 38 times in this book, this word Hevel is used. And never again. 38 times. Now, this word Hevel is translated in your version, vanity or meaningless or emptiness or something like that. And what the translators are doing is trying to get a word that captures the idea. But this word is really a picture word. It's a metaphor word. The word literally means vapor or breath. That's what the word means. Vapor of vapors. Breath of breath, says the preacher. Vapor of vapors. The idea there is a vapor that is there for a moment and then Vanishes. And so there's a couple of ideas here, really, that, are, that we need to hold on to with this word of Hevel, which is so central to the message of Ecclesiastes. The first one is that vapor is temporary and fleeting. Right? Some, um, some translations, which are just trying to get at the heart of it, will use, use the word soap bubble. Like it's a bubble that you blow for your kids, and you see it floating through the air, and you know at some point it's going to pop. It may last for an extra second or two, but it's going to pop, and it will pop very often, totally unexpectedly. That that's what... That's what life is. That's what we're dealing with here is this idea of hevel of hevels. It's temporary. It's fleeting. Here for a minute, gone to the next. But it's more than that. It's more than just that all these things we're doing are temporary. It's more than just that all these things we're doing are fleeting. It's also that a vapor, like think about like a cloud, is something that looks like you can grab it. And it looks like you can reach out and you can, you can hold on to it. But as soon as you do, you realize that you can't touch it at all. But there's vapor in front of you and you want to grab the vapor so that you can do whatever with it. And you reach out to grab it and your hand just goes through it because you can't hold it at all. You can't grab onto it. You can't thus control it. Life is like this. Kohelet says, life is like a vapor and that is temporary and fleeting. Life is also like a vapor because we want to reach out and grab it and just kind of control how things go. And we do so, and then we realize over and over that this control we thought we were going to have is not actually there. And many commentators think that uh, Ecclesiastes is almost a part two response to Proverbs, where Proverbs has good things that are true a lot of the time. But the nature of them being proverbial means they're not always true. For instance, like Proverbs says, basically, if you do good, you'll get good in general. But then Kohelet says, but sometimes you do good and you get bad. Right? You thought you had control of it. Right? You thought you knew how it worked. I thought, okay, I do good and I get good. That, that's how things work. And then, and then one time it doesn't go that way. And then two times it doesn't go that way. And you think... Or a, a, a common one, train up a child in the way he should, he should go. When he gets old, he will not depart from it. Yeah, most of the time that's true. But then there will be the time where the child departs from it anyway. And you think, and you, you reached out for what you thought was solid, and it turns out it was vapor. It turns out it was hevel. That it, it wasn't controllable like you thought it was. Um, we have four children, Ariel and I. Cohen, our fourth, uh, has been wonderful. Sweet, kind, affectionate, obedient, we say go to bed, he goes. Until about, until about like four months ago. And about four months ago, for some reason, unbeknownst to us, he becomes just a royal turd. I mean, just <laughs> whining and upset and fighting it. And, you know, just, and, and like, but here's, what, here's the point. is like, we were like fourth kid. We've nailed it, you know? Like we figured out parenting. You know, we've, we've, basically, we've, we've done it. We know what to do now. We can control it. If we had 10 more kids, they'd all be like him. Per perfect, affectionate, loving children. And then all of a sudden we realized like, that thing we thought we were holding on to just puffs in the... And we're like, I don't know. <laughs> you, you ever had that experience where you think you have an idea about how something works and then something else happens and, and you're like, I have no idea anymore. Like, I don't know. I thought I knew and then I don't. This is, this is the message here of Ecclesiastes. This is how things work. You think you have a hold of something and then you realize <laughs> you, you ain't got a hold of anything. When, uh, when, when we were kids... I know, I know you'll, this, this is probably obvious, I'm probably going to tell you this, but I was a very good child, right? Very good child. My brother, on the other hand, was difficult at times. And so we had these friends in, in, in Atlanta. That their names were the Williamses, and I remember them very well. And I love this story. Mom still tells it from time to time. Uh, Caleb was a difficult child. I was a good child, as, as 
Sister Luann says, I, I just had the gift of obedience. Right? Some kids just have the gift of obedience. I, I did. I was just a good kid. I was scared of disobeying. Caleb, not so much. Right? A little more fun, that kid. The Williams had two older children, Kyle and Ashley. Kyle and Ashley had the gift of obe- good kids. They were just good. No, just obedient kids. So we would go hang out at their house, and Caleb would be Caleb, you know, do some Caleb things, perhaps. And the parents, one time, maybe multiple times, went to my parents and said, you know, really, it's all in the parenting. If you would just, very good friends of theirs, right? If you would just do things the way that we're doing things, he wouldn't act like that, right? And so mom and dad, very graciously, people they love, kind of just accepted it and appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> and then the Lord, as the Lord does, gave them a third child. And that child, that child was named Michael. And Michael made Caleb look like the saint of all saints. This child was a nightmare. 100%, this is true. The kid, the kid thought he was a bulldog for like seven months and would just bite and go around barking and stuff. Kid was insane, totally nuts. And there was a moment in time where the parents came to my parents and said, we're sorry. Like we, had, we, had, we had no idea. We had no idea. Turns out we don't have control over what kids become and what kids do. And parenting is, is one of the great examples of that. that you, can ra- you can raise two kids exactly the same, do all the same things, and they can end up so different that it blows your mind, right? It just doesn't make... Because, because we, like in every other area of life, think that, okay, if I follow A, B, and C steps, then D is going to come. And it just doesn't come all the time. And this is the message of Ecclesiastes. Stop thinking you can control things. <laughs> Stop thinking you have control. There is one that has control, and that one is not you, and you should praise him for that because you were in no position to have that sort of control where it would be a good thing. Kohelet says, essentially, everything is fleeting. Everything is uncontrollable, and that we spend most of our time investing energy and emotion into either trying to control things that we cannot control or into things that ultimately have no significance at all with our eyes always in the future and rarely really on the present. Conclusion of the book basically is this. Accept the hevel. Accept the vapor. Live in a life knowing that this is the world that is. It's not the world that you want it to be, maybe, but it's the world that is. And the wise people, according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, according to Kohelet, the wise people accept the fact that this is the world that is and they live in it. And the ever more frantic pursuit of such things like control and over these vanities is always accompanied by spiritual emptiness and world weariness as people strive to achieve what they can never possess. That is what the majority of the world is doing. As you watch them walk around the mall and drive past you, they are striving for things that they can never actually possess. Imagine... Imagine dropping a mouse into a maze and putting cheese in the middle of the maze so that the mouse can smell the cheese, but the cheese is actually blocked off and and the mouse will never actually get to the cheese. They can get close to it. They can never actually get it. Imagine what that would do to a mouse. Imagine what that would do to you. Because that's exactly what's happening to the majority of the world. As they think this thing is close, that they've almost got it, they can smell it, whatever it is, it's there, and I can grab it, and I can hold it, I can control it, I can make it mine, I can be joyful, I can be fulfilled, whatever it is, but they never actually get to it. And so quite naturally, you end up feeling frantic and eventually feeling depressed. This is the life of the majority. As long as you believe that life is basically malleable, meaning basically able to be controlled, able to move to your own purposes, you will never enjoy the gift of life that God has given you as he intends. We're like a kid on a roller coaster for the first time who is mad because he can't control which direction the the roller coaster goes. There's going to be some ups. (laughs) There's going to be some downs. And you can't really have any say-so about it. It's just going to happen. And Kohelet says, once you accept that, life becomes the gift of God that he intends for it to be. There are going to be some things that are great, and there are going to be some things that are difficult. Once you accept the uncontrollability, things will be better. Kohelet says, the universe that we inhabit comes from God's hand and comes to us as his gift. Our lives, our very lives, our continuing being able to breathe, are a gift offered for a short period and then taken back again. Embrace life for what it is, not what you would like it to be. 
Live it out before God, reverencing Him and obeying Him. This is the pathway on which joy lies. Even though pain and puzzlement will be there, there will be times where you don't understand why in the world this is happening. The message in large part here is expect that. It is part of this journey that we call life. It's part of the, it's part of the heaven. We don't, we don't like this. We don't like not being in control. This is seen, seen perhaps most chiefly in salvation. We would like salvation that says, all right, I'll do these things, and then God is forced to hand over his gift. But that's not the message at all. The message is that you have to come to Christ for Christ, by Christ, by his glory, for his glory, by his power, for his power that he is offering you as his gift to you salvation, that all you can really do is believe that it's true and bow. As we look over this book over the next few weeks, however long it takes, live a life that accepts the heaven. Live a life that accepts the uncontrollability and thanks God that though it feels like the world's out of control, that he is in absolute and utter control. I don't know what you're facing right now personally. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your anxieties are. I don't know what you're afraid of. I know a lot of them probably are not worthy of your anxieties. But I do know, without exception, that every one of them, God is in control of. That nothing is going to happen to you today or tomorrow or the next day that will surprise Him. And that you can find peace in His control. And even peace in your lack of it. If we can help you at all, if we can pray for you, if we can baptize you into Christ, help you to know Him more, help you to live in this world, Oh, please come while we stand and while we sing.